Ebola has arrived in Europe. In recent weeks, we've had around a dozen cases, some suspected, some confirmed. A UN aid worker died in hospital in Germany. A Spanish nurse became critically ill. Teresa Romero caught the virus while treating a missionary who returned sick from Sierra Leone. She's now been given the all clear. But could this virus come to Ireland? And if it does, are we prepared? We've had one close call when a woman from Tyrrellstown in Dublin was quarantined. She didn't have Ebola and has since been released. If anyone else shows symptoms, they'll be treated here at the National Isolation Unit at the Mater Hospital in Dublin. They'll be tested here at the National Virus Reference Lab in UCD, where staff have been investigating and diagnosing viral infections for the last 40 years. Now, testing for Ebola takes about six hours per sample, and if its presence is ever confirmed by lab tests here, it'll be the first time scientists or doctors have seen it on these shores. Experts here think it's unlikely Ebola will make its way to Ireland, but say they're fully prepared if it does. We've had plans in place since 2002 to deal with viral hemorrhagic fevers, of which Ebola is one. They were updated in 2012 and trialled in 2013, so we think our preparedness is good. If Ebola arrives, it won't be the first time Ireland's faced a national health crisis. Swine flu killed 26 people here. BSE nearly brought the country to a standstill. But what makes Ebola different to other epidemics? The mortality rate for a start. Some people died of swine flu, but a lot of folk who got it uh, had a very mild illness. So the mortality rate and even the rate of getting very sick was quite low. With Ebola, as you said, it's 70%. People who are most infectious are people who are actually at a very advanced stage of the illness, those who are dying, and also dead bodies are very infectious. That's been one of the problems in Sierra Leone and Liberia, that people have traditional funeral rites and they want to hold their loved one's dead body and wash them and kiss them, maybe kiss their mouth, and thereby are exposed to perhaps blood and, and other body fluids of their dead relatives, and that, that's extremely infectious. At, at those advanced stages of, of, of the, the disease and during death, the, 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 there are about um, 900 million viral particles per milliliter of blood. So it's a huge viral load, so it's extremely infectious at the latter stages of the disease. There's always this concern of, of, of spread to healthcare workers. What I think is, is confident is that we won't have a, a sustained epidemic and ongoing spread to the general population. So it wouldn't become an epidemic in Ireland. But the World Health Organization was quick to dub this a global health emergency, appealing to all nations to do what they can to help stop the spread. Last week, the US sent troops to build care centers in Liberia. It called on other countries to do more to fight the disease. This is going to take a collective global response, all hands on deck. That's the only way to get it done. If we don't adequately address this current outbreak now, then Ebola has the potential to become a scourge like HIV or polio that we will end up fighting, all of us, for decades. There are also fears that Ebola could evolve. The cell biology of Ebola is consistent with it, the possibility of it going airborne. That is, that is not an impossibility. It's, people have compared it and said, well, HIV has never gone airborne. That cannot happen. HIV cannot go airborne for a variety of scientific reasons. Ebola can, that it has an inherent capacity to do that, even though, once again, I must emphasize, we have no evidence that that's how it's transmitted. The question now is, can Ebola be cured? Or at the very least, can we vaccinate against it? Trials on human patients are underway in Maryland in the US with a small group of volunteers. They're being given a new vaccine called VSV Ebov, developed by scientists in Canada. This is a phase one trial, so the main thing we're concerned about here is safety, uh, and we'll be following people very, very closely. What we do saves lives, and uh, we like being a part of that, and being a part of a team that's engaged in a global response to a disease that kills lots and lots of people. In the absence of a vaccine, all hospitals can do is hope for the best and be prepared for the worst. Many, like this one in Ottawa, Canada, have been carrying out drills in anticipation of dealing with the disease. Having the opportunity to go through the process is very helpful for us. Um, things that we need to focus on are certainly ensuring that our, that our education is ongoing and current for all of our staff and our physicians, and as well uh, making sure that the communication process is consistent. 
It's hard to know as it stands just how bad things could get. Some are predicting worldwide cases and six-figure infection rates within the next three months. At the moment, whether you're talking Freetown or Monrovia, uh, these cities have out-of-control Ebola. And if it continues in this vein, we're looking at more than a million people being infected by the end of the year. If that happens, the fallout will become very much financial, making Ebola not just a medical emergency, but an economic one too. The World Bank says the trio of worst affected African countries has already lost around 280 million euro. It says if things get worse, Liberia in particular could be facing losses next year of almost 12% of GDP. This would put the very stability of those already poor countries at risk. Economic, political and social survival all under threat. The developed world would better weather the storm. But here in Ireland, it's the fear of the unknown causing concern with frontline staff. That and the fact they say they've had very little training. Of course, the nurses and midwives are to the front line of all healthcare. They will more than likely be the first people to come in contact with somebody who's symptomatic. Sufficient numbers of our members are contacting us to, to make us concerned enough to write to the employer and ask them specific questions, which are what protective measures are in place, what trial runs are you going to run, what equipment are you using, and how are you going to isolate, considering our hospitals are currently overcrowded. <laughs> Their international counterparts are saying similar things. Nurses and doctors taking to the streets, saying their hospitals aren't ready, their workers aren't prepared. We're seeing that caregivers who are not being adequately trained are being blamed. And say, we're hearing that they have not followed proper protocol. We know how to stop Ebola from spreading in hospitals, but that doesn't mean it's easy. It's hard. It means you need meticulous attention to detail. We have been asking our hospitals throughout the country to provide us with training that allows us to ask questions, with training about how to put on the proper and optimal level of uh, personal protection equipment. GPs say stick to the hospitals. Presenting to them should not be an option. We need to take the pressure off general practice. We cannot be directing people to general practice if they're sick. There needs to be a dedicated number of a free phone nature with appropriate staff manning that. And certainly the HPSC and the HSE need to engage with the Irish Medical Organisation and other representative bodies who feel there are concerns that must be addressed. But what happens in Ireland is the least of the world's Ebola worries. The priority is, as it ever was, stamping it out at the source. Whatever we do, there will be some risk here. We can't get that risk to zero until we have it controlled in West Africa. So we have to make sure that whatever we do doesn't undermine the efforts there. Until uh, Mr. Duncan came to the United States and until the nurses were infected in Spain, it almost didn't seem real to people. But let me tell you, right now the conversation is very dangerous because the only way to stop these cases from coming over is to get a fully adequate response in those three countries. And, you know, right now people are saying, well, let's have more checks at the airports. This is like trying to put wet towels under your door when your house is on fire. You've got to put the fire out, and the fire is in these three countries. The only way to stop it is to continue to step up our response and provide humane, effective care and prevent new infections in these three countries. The Irish government has been criticised by aid agencies for not sending troops to the worst hit regions, but it has donated two and a half million euro in aid, being used to fund treatment centres, ambulances and safe burial at designated sites. If the worst case scenario predictions ring true, many more of those will be needed in the coming months. Medical aid agency Médecins Sans Frontières says it's a battle we are losing, but those on the ground have no plans to forfeit the fight. You cannot sit on the sidelines and watch this develop. There is no nation that is immune, and so I would just ask people to think about action. This is about loving your fellow man. And love is a verb. That means you act. So while we'll do a lot of tangible things, we'll build this hospital, we'll build these Ebola treatment units, we'll provide these labs, a lot of these tangible things, but there's a lot of intangible nature to this fight. And you want to give people the resiliency, the hope, 
that they can continue on and fight this and see this through. And that they're not alone. And that they're not alone. There is no better fight worth fighting than the one in Liberia right now. Soldiers are used to moving toward the sounds of the guns. These are the loudest guns that the world has heard in a long time. Thank you.